symptoms, uh, like she said, are very similar to other things. So sometimes it takes a long time to get a diagnosis. There's really, other than that super expensive medicine, there's really no treatment for it. You just have to treat the symptoms. Um, it's usually fatal within three years. So as the disease progresses, when it first starts, what's my biggest risk for my patient? Falls. 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 Because their balance is affected and they can't, um, they can't get around. Then as the disease progresses, what would be my next? Expiration. The swallowing, because they can't swallow. Uh, and so they can aspirate really easily. And then it eventually becomes a respiratory issue because the muscles, even in their diaphragm and their muscles in their chest and stuff, they are muscle wasting too, and they can't, they just can't get enough oxygen in there. Um, weakness, muscle fatigue. Y'all are too young to remember this, but you remember, your grannies probably watched it. You remember the soap opera that was on The Guiding Light? Mm -hmm. There was a guy on The Guiding mm -hmm. Light who had Lou Gehrig's disease, and it's the only documented case of a client with Lou Gehrig's disease when he started tripping and falling and having the balance <coughs> issues to all the way at the end when he died on the show, he was in a wheelchair, couldn't speak, um, and it's completely documented in film, the progression from the beginning to the end. Uh, it's pretty fun to watch. Uh, they have a stiff, clumsy gait at first, abnormal reflexes, and think about this. If you stay in the same position all the time, mm -hmm. what do you think their feet are gonna look like eventually? Drop. You're gonna have foot drop. Their hands are going to curl in mm -hmm. till their nails are quite either the palm. So you want to, as they start getting to the contractures, you want to make sure you're putting that towel, towel or roll or washcloth roll on their hands to keep them from injuring themselves. Because once they're contracted, you ain't going to get them back mm -mm. out straight. So you got to figure out a way to minimize that. So splints. So who's going to help you with that kind of stuff? OT. OT, physical therapy. Uh, Who's going to help you with the swallowing and the diets? Speech, Speech. Speech therapy. So is Nutrition. this a one-man show? And dietitian. No. No. no, sure not. You need to know who your resources are. Yes. So we don't do any type of like passive range of motion. Yes. Oh, we mm -hmm. do. Okay. But you, are you going to go home and make splints for them? No. No. But you can go to OT and they can make splints, custom-made splints for the guy mm -hmm. or the girl, whoever. They affect men more than women, though. Mm -hmm. Um. So that's that's his tombstone. I guess I only took care of him two years ago. It seemed like twenty. Because uh, I wasn't a nurse, I didn't start working until ninety-seven. Okay, so we talked about the need. We got to be able to communicate with this dude. We got to be able to feed him. Um, we got to get him to his doctor's appointments. Mm -hmm. Does that take a lot of equipment? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you see the financial and emotional burden this has on the family? Oh, yeah. A lot. There's a lot to this. Never goes away. He's gonna die. You all know that from the time he's diagnosed. It's just a matter of how well can I take care of him and keep him around forever. But this disease is going to progress, and your, the, the eventual outcome is the client's gonna end up dying. Um, that is the only drug that's approved. Super, super expensive. I don't think you're gonna see that on Inclex, but it is in the book. They, they added it to the book this time. That was one of the changes. <laughs> Um, so, any questions about those four that are neurotransmitter disorders? So, dopamine. What's that do for you? That's your pleasure sensor. It's happy, joyful. Think of Muhammad Ali's face. Huntington's disease. That makes you. You got your GABA. GABA. You remember what Daniel looked like and what kind of wrist Daniel would have. My Cena Gravis. With our little lady who couldn't wait up out of the Acetylcholine is the problem, and it affects the muscles and the nerves in your face, and you're swallowing. And then uh, ALS. Which one was it? Do you remember? Yeah, that was the Asian guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the Asian guy, the little guy from China. And think about, when you about him, the toll that it takes on him and his family, both emotionally, financially, physically. I mean, his wife looks like she's ready to drop. Mm -hmm. And she still has to take care of him every single day. Yes? What is like the common thing that kills them? Is it the brain generation or? For ALS, it's respiratory. Mm -hmm. Their mind is completely intact. 
does not affect their mind at all. So does their heart get weak too since that's a muscle? You, usually it's their lungs. Yeah, just picture up there. Like you said, pneumonia. She was asking about Stephen Hawking. I was like, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's the one you're going to know. And Michael J. Fox. Michael J. Michael J. Fox has heart mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Although, okay, when I look at him, board. he looks like he has Huntington's. Yeah, she's not confusing yeah. my billboards. Yeah. He's on a couple of billboards. Yeah, well, no. He doesn't have any of He has Huntington's. So, let's talk about these last two that are myelin sheath problems. Mm. So, the normal myelin sheath looks like that one on the top. Nice and smooth. Those neurotransmitters and the signals slide right over that lipid material, okay? See how they're all chewed up? So, the only difference between these two is, well, that's not true. The biggest difference between these two is multiple sclerosis is a progressive disease. Gillian Barre, although you can have a lot of deficits from it, you can recover from Gillian Barre. So of all the neurotransmitter things that we're talking about, the six of them, Gillian Barre is the only one that your patient can recover from. Okay? Isn't that just mono? Mm -hmm. No mono is a precursor to it though. Really? Mm -hmm. Lots of viral things. So let's talk about multiple mm -hmm. sclerosis first. Um, it's chronic, it's progressive, there's an autoimmune component to it, usually between 20 and 40 years old and usually female. Males, however, can get this. I worked with the nurse one time, <coughs> every night he'd be staggering around and I'm like, man, why is Wyatt coming to work drunk? <laughs> well, we didn't know why I had multiple sclerosis and things have a balance issues. We thought he had a drinking problem. <laughs> uh, the cause is not known, but there are some environmental things that they've looked at, autoimmune things, but it's really not known. So, because it's not really known, there's not a lot of preventive things that you can do for this. It is familial, it kind of tends to run in families. There's no specific labs. Sometimes if you do a lumbar puncture in the cerebral spinal fluid, they'll see extra protein and extra white blood cells, but that's not diagnostic definitive. This is the definitive test, an MRI, that is positive when there's a presence of plaques. Now, I know you all know what plaques means when we're talking about cardiac stuff. What's that mean? Build up in the arteries. Build up of lipids in your cardiac vessels. Well, the word plaque here is talking about the like chewed calcium. up places on the myelin sheet. The okay. white matter. Yes, it's chewed up, yep. So it's, it's different, it's not a build up, it's actually a chewing up, tearing down of that myelin sheet in the white matter. So you just kind of, when you're looking at it, just remember that plaque here means a little bit different than plaque with cardiac. There are four major kinds. You don't need it. You need to know a little bit about this in here. We talk more about this in level three, so I'm giving you like just the basics because it is on your syllabus, and you might see a question on your test. Let me ask you a question. If I say a client has multiple sclerosis and they um, blah blah blah, and the answer is at risk for falls, does it really matter if it says multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's disease nope. or whatever? Nope. The big concept is what is the risk? risk. Okay. What's what's the risk for this patient in this situation? So that little distractor of the disease, that's just a fool ya. It works sometimes. Um, four types. The one you're gonna see most of the time in the beginning is that blue line at the top. They have a period where they have an exacerbation and then you can see they go right back down to their baseline and they have another period. It could be a month, it could be a couple years, it could be a long time. And then they have another exacerbation and go right back to their baseline. And that is how most of them start the progression with multiple sclerosis. Secondary prognosis, uh, progressive is once they've had this for several years, your body, I hate to tell you this as you get older, just doesn't recover like it used to. And can you see how they have periods of exacerbation, but every time they come back, they don't go back, back to their baseline. So they lose a little bit of function in the process. Then progressive, relapsing and primary progressive. This one on the green is very rare. It's just, they never go back to their baseline ever. They just constantly have 
And this usually happens in older people and usually males, the little green line. But the one I want you to know about is they have periods of exacerbation and remission and we need to know what do I need to teach my patient to keep them from having an exacerbation. That's what you really need to know in level two, okay? Here's our symptoms. Uh, what does nystagmus mean? Yeah, they have that, the eye goes back and forth. They can't control that. It just shakes back and forth. You already know what diplopia is because it's the double vision. They have some blurred vision. Dysarthria is the inability to use your muscles to make the sounds you want to make. Nothing's wrong up here cognitively. I just can't get it out. And you know what dysphagia is. This is the big thing with these people. They have a lot of bladder issues and bowel issues. And it's real embarrassing. I mean, if you're a 48 year old woman and you have a job and you have an exacerbation to this and all of a sudden you have no control over your bladder, it's embarrassing. They tend to isolate themselves and they have a huge incident of depression with multiple sclerosis patients. Mm -hmm. uh, they have some weakness, muscle spasticity. What is vertigo? Dizziness. They stand up, they're off balance and dizzy. And uh, what is ataxia? It's the inability to, to make your muscles do what you want them to do. So normally when you hear it, you're talking about walking, but it can also be the inability to pick up the remote and change the channel because I can't get my muscles to do what I want them to do. Um, tinnitus, what's that mean? Bring it in the ears. Okay. So if you know what the words are, you'll know what the question's talking about. So our goal for treatment, because they're never going to get better and over this, is to um, minimize the exacerbations and minimize the symptoms, okay? You can't do this alone either. They need speech therapy. They need to see an eye doctor if they're having vision problems. Uh, they need physical therapy. Home health, they might need meals on wheels. They might need transportation to and from doctors. Uh, I don't know about y'all, but that makes me tired. I can't do all that. Mm -mm. So I know my resources, though, that can help me get that right. done. These are the medicines that are on your syllabus, the immunomodulators. Here's what I want you to know about this. There are immunosuppressants. Did we already <laughs> talked about prednisone? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So their signs and symptoms are mm -hmm. the same. The things you need to teach your patient are the same. Weight gain, blood sugar going up, stay away from infected people. I, the nurse, am gonna protect you from infection. The only thing I do want you to know, fingolimod, the biggest side effect from that is bradycardia. So what other additional piece do I need to teach my patient? Check your pulse. Check your pulse. And if your pulse is below 60, you need to let your doctor know because it can cause severe bradycardia. So their anti-immune um, drugs that suppress the immune system, but fingolimod can cause bradycardia, okay? Uh, and then you also can treat them with immunosuppressants. So immunomodulators changes the course of the disease. <laughs> immunosuppressants suppress the immune system. But your teaching for them is the same for your patient. There's an excellent concept map. There's actually some excellent ones for a lot of these, but there's an excellent one for the care of this patient in your book, and that's the page number it's on. And it talks about what the problem is, what I need to do as a nurse, and what my outcome should be, okay? And it gives you, it goes through like the list of all of their symptoms and all of their problems that they might have. We're gonna talk about a few of them though. When they go to the doctor initially, the doctor needs an assessment. You know, what's going on? How long has it been going on? Tell me what your symptoms are. They have a whole list of questions to go through. Uh, they're going to go see a neurologist about this. You're going to assess them for falls. Have you ever fallen? How's your balance? You're going to ask them about those. Vision issues. Are you having trouble with your vision? Uh, they need to see an ophthalmologist. What's the difference between an optometrist and an ophthalmologist? <sighs> Well, it just checks your eyes for sight, right? And the other one checks for diseases of your eyes? Yes. One is just an eye doctor, and one is actually a medical doctor who is an eye doctor. This person needs to see the ophthalmologist, because that is a medical doctor who is also an eye doctor. 
If your patient has double vision, they can wear a patch on one eye. Now, do I want them to become a pirate and only wear it on their left eye ever? No, switch it. No, they alternate. You need to alternate the patch because I don't want to leave it on my left eye all the time and that eye becomes weaker. So I want to switch it from left to right so that I'm using both of my eyes, but I'm eliminating the double vision when I'm trying to read or do whatever. Oops, sorry about that. Um, they need to get rest. I think, yes? How often would you switch the eye patch? I think your book says every two to four hours to switch it on. Uh, you're going to teach the client to get adequate rest and avoid stress, like I said yesterday. You have to get rid of your family, your job, mm -hmm. your beach. I don't know. But the less stress they have, the less exacerbations they're going to have. If you're tired and you need to take a nap, you need to take a nap. You know, I don't know if you've ever talked to people who don't like to take a nap. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're tired, you're going to make your symptoms worse if you don't go take a nap. Eye doctor must be important, it's not there twice, that's a mistake, sorry. Uh, assistive devices. If you're having trouble getting around, you may have to temporarily use a walker or a cane or something to help you get around. You may need a little one with the seat so that when you're tired, you can sit down. They don't like to hear that. It's your job to convince them it's a great idea. Uh, assist them with bowel and bladder issues. So, I have urinary retention. I can't pee. Oh, that's too bad. We'll send you to your urologist. You can teach them. You're going to teach them to go. You're going to not cap themselves. You're going to teach them ways to try to relax those muscles and make themselves be able to go to the bathroom, things like that. So you need to provide some assistance. So if you don't know how to do an in and out cap, you certainly aren't going to be able to teach your patients. So you're not, you got to know how to do things like that. Uh, bowel issues. You can teach them bowel training things, but sometimes this is more of just a diarrhea issue and they can't control it. So that takes a lot of emotional support. I'm not a real emotional support kind of person. So. Uh, you're not going to see these people in the hospital either, primarily for multiple sclerosis. You're going to see them in the hospital for something the sim else. The symptoms they, from it. Right. You're going to see them for something else. Um, coping skills. If you have somebody who has this and they have really periods of bad times and they have zero coping skills, those bad times get worse. Mm -hmm. So you may have to help them learn some coping skills. Uh, they may not be happy with the situation. And they may have some negative thoughts about the situation. Uh, just to be honest with you, I am not the right nurse for them to talk to about that. But there are right nurses out there who can talk to them. Set realistic goals. This person is not going to go out and run a marathon. Let's just walk around the perimeter of Walmart today. You know what I'm saying? So sometimes you have to bring them back to reality and say, do you really think that you can do that and help them set some realistic goals? But all of this is straight from the care plan that's in your, the concept about that's in your book. Collaborate with speech therapy because they're the ones who's going to do your swallow studies and decide what kind of diet this person needs to be on and needs to be modified. They're very forgetful, okay? So the more you can write down and put in writing, because if I tell Chelsea, and Chelsea goes home and she'll be like, I think she said something about such and such. <laughs> Nobody was there with her to hear the instructions, but she has them in writing, that's way better. You're gonna take this pill three times a day at this particular time. Yeah. Um, Resources from the National MS Society, which they have those locally in all the states, and I think there's one here on the Gulf Coast. Uh, does this person need to do any activity? Or do they just need to sit around? No, they need to do activity. Yeah, activity. They need to do activity. But I don't want them out doing really stressful, high stress things. Yoga, walking, swimming. Another thing that's not on this slide that you need to be aware of, temperature affects these uh, multiple sclerosis patients. It makes them, um, it exacerbates the condition if they are high or low. And um, so they need to not be in extreme temperature changes. Let's see if I can find a little video of her. All these video links are in your PowerPoint too if you ever want to look at it again. Just kind of helps you put a picture with the patient. I'm sorry, I have to do this. Hi, my name is Erica. 
and I have been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. I've had it for a little over three years. I was an athlete. I could move around. Now my mobility has been deterred a lot. My balance just to try to stay up and not teeter over. Um, very exhausting, very hard to do. The walking is the most to where when I'm walking, I'm tipping over. Mm -hmm. Do you know? fall? Yes. I'm getting a sensation now to where I don't even think my left leg is remembering okay. how to walk. Okay.
I mean, <laughs> it's like my 12-year-old, so. Yeah, definitely. He's excited. <laughs> Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. She's still got a way to go, but she can make a recovery. So this is yeah. that's the difference between the Gillian Beret and the rest of them. This one they can actually make a recovery from. Mm -hmm. um, it does affect both genders, male and female. Usually it peaks when you're 55 because guess what happens when you get older? Mm -hmm. Your immune system lessens. I just had a viral illness, and now I can get Gillian Beret from that. But remember. Yes. Sorry. Um, is it's not a virus. It is it's not a virus. By a virus. Pre a, a precursor to Gillian Barre is a virus, a viral infection. It's from you damage to the myelin. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. It comes from that. Um, they're acutely ill, but it's reversible. Doesn't affect their level of consciousness. So she knew the whole time she was sick. Oh. She was sick. You can see she was on a respirator. She had a trach. Uh, so he carried her in, it said at the end, you can see the muscle wasting. Mm -hmm. When she was in rehab trying to put that milk in the garage, I just think it was going to end up on the floor. Mm. Um, but if it progresses ascending and it's coming up, it starts affecting the diaphragm yeah. and your respiratory muscles. Respiratory. So that's where can't they really breathe. get into trouble is that they have respiratory distress and they can't breathe. So what kind of things do I need to be monitoring? Her oxygen, O2. her lungs, their, their lung sounds, their Listen pulse socks, things All like that. Blue, uh, urine output, because if I'm not putting out urine, it's going somewhere. <laughs> so I need to be making sure that they're not uh, collecting fluid in their lungs. <clears throat> this usually has three phases. Clearly, I was hard. Recovery spell wrong. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Here's your picture. Just remember when you're thinking about Gillian Murray, remember the arrows, that it starts <coughs> at the outside and yeah. works its way in. So you're going to see the outside symptoms, the risk of fall, the not being able to grab things before you see the respiratory symptoms. Um, that's just your picture so you can have something to kind of put in your head. Treatment is the plasmapheresis, which we already talked about, where they filter the antibodies out in the plasma. IVIG is that blood product, the gamma globulin, super expensive mm -hmm. here in the ICU. It will probably be covered on your insurance. Uh, they do go to the intensive care unit, okay, because they're a little more than you can handle on the floor with your other six patients. <coughs> uh, respiratory is the problem. You want to enhance mobility. Did you see her hands were already a little contracted? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So she's going to have to really work because, you know, once those tendons shorten, you can't stretch the back out. So they need really good physical therapy in rehab to prevent those complications from happening. See how skinny she was? Mm -hmm. She could have a nutrition problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she can't swallow, can't eat. So you gotta be thinking about nutrition. What labs tell me about nutrition? Mm -hmm. Protein and albumin. Mm -hmm. Tell me about nutrition. Uh, and I want to monitor her for complication. And you saw she was in the rehab. Now, I love rehab, y'all. I think we're out of school. I wish I was a physical therapist. Yeah. Uh, when my mom was in rehab for her knees, I thought that was just the coolest thing, watching those physical therapists. Uh, I chose the wrong profession. But she went to rehab. Ten months. She was from the time she went into the hospital until she went home from rehab. Ten months. That's a long time. Mm -hmm. Think of the take toll on her family. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. Saw she had two kids and yeah. a husband. Mm -hmm. Financially. <laughs> Emotionally, trying to get support. When you don't live in here, any family, you gotta have somebody help you with the kids. So all those things, keep them in mind with all these diseases. That this takes a toll not only on the patient, 
but on the resources of the family, okay? So let's talk about these diets and then we'll be done. Um, our goal is to promote their nutrition because we want them to have the nutrition they need, but we've got to prevent aspiration, okay? So safety with the aspiration comes first. I don't want you to aspirate, but I also want you to get the calories that you need. So we're going to talk about a couple different kinds of diets. Ooh, full liquid diets. So that's for a client who has a swallowing issue, and if you give them something thin like water or tea or something like that, they choke on it because it, it just doesn't go down right. So they thicken it with thicken. Anybody use thicken in the nursing home? Mm -hmm. well, let me tell you about thicken. First of all, you can thicken anything. They say you can't, but you really can, and I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. um, you thicken it, and as you put it in the liquid, it thickens it up to make it either honey thick, so like when I pick it up, it's like milk is full thick. Honey thick means like when you have a spoonful of honey and you tip it over and you know how it kind of comes off. And then pudding thick is like a gelato pudding. So the more you put in and the longer you let it sit, the gelato the your it, stuff yeah. gets. So I personally do not understand how this quenches somebody's thirst if you're thirsty, but if you can't swallow, my risk of aspiration trumps your feeling satisfied, you know? <laughs> But I'll tell you about this guy that I think and stuff up for. That guy, when I worked at Keesler, and he had terminal cancer, he had had a surgery, and he like had, he was literally held together with a moon back. Like you could see his intestines and stuff, because he had no skin left to close them up. So he was held together with a moon back. He had a tray, which he pulled out every night, which I popped right back in. And I kept telling him, I don't know why you do that, because as soon as you do that, I'm gonna put it right back in. And he didn't do it for me anymore. He didn't hurt anybody else though. They were afraid. I wasn't afraid. And uh, he, I went in there one night, and he was in a bad mood, terrible mood. I said, "What is wrong with you?" And he's like, "I just want to watch. I just want to watch the baseball game and have a beer." I'm like, "Well, let me find a baseball game." And then I went to the desk and I called the doctor and I said, "This dude wants a beer." Mm -hmm. and he's like, "Well, he has to have thick and liquids." Okay. So I got an order for a beer, one beer with his volume. So I called the pharmacy and I got one beer. And I thickened it up for him. And I'll just tell y'all, first time I had to give a patient booze in the hospital, I was like, hmm, this seems wrong. But then again, I ain't gonna fix that problem. It's kind of jealous. <laughs> I was like, I'm on some of that. I mean, you know, like, this seems wrong, but okay. And a doctor explained to me, he's here so we can heal his wound. We are not gonna fix his alcoholism and give him the beer. So, anyway, thickened up his beer, and I gave it to him, and he was the happiest man the rest of the night. He drank his thickened beer and watched his baseball game, and when I came back the next night, he had an order for four a day. He didn't last much longer The beer didn't kill him, but at least he died happy. So, you can thicken anything. You just got to be cautious, because the more you put in the liquid, and the longer you let it set, the thicker it gets. Yeah. Okay? Um, it's fabulous. Then we have this fabulous diet here. Have you guys seen those? In yes, we had those in the nursing home a lot. I love in the hospital that for one entire week, the only vegetable that they know how to compress in the little mold is carrots. And then the next week, it's peas. I mean, geez, mix it up a little bit. Who wants to eat the same thing every day? That to me looks very unappealing. But if your patient's choking to death and that's what they have to eat, that's what they have to eat. So the, the top one is a pureed pudding-like consistency. Everything is wet, lots of gravy. Um, they don't have to chew anything to get it down. Yeah, even meat's pureed. Everything. It's disgusting. <laughs> um, I don't like being I don't know. The dessert really is that, really good. <laughs> that, <laughs> I don't like the dessert. It takes too long. <laughs> <laughs> I'd really be ten better. Anyway, the next one is moist, semi-solid foods, things like that. So you could do like um, chicken noodle soup with nothing salt, like mash it up, and then soft would be your chicken noodle soup not mashed up or some kind of meat that's not really pureed but super like. 
cooked in the crock pot, you know, super soft, and they don't really have to chew. So those are your <laughs> kind of diets that you're going to see orders for in the hospital us. on patients who need <laughs> an altered diet other than regular or low salt, things like that. Those are the words you're going to see. Tube feeding. Has anybody ever smelled tube feeding? Mm -hmm. Oh, it smells disgusting. Uh, Probably just as bad as baby formula. The of this is if I can give them tube feeding instead of feeding through their IV, this is called interol, meaning it goes through the GI tract mm -hmm. feedings. I'm doing a couple things. I'm giving them the nutrients that they need, and I'm maintaining the function of the GI tract. Because the longer I don't use the GI tract, the it more likely it is for it to just stop working. So I really, if I can, am trying to preserve the function of my GI tract. Um, there's lots of different tube feedings out there. There's ones for diabetics. There's ones for kidney patients. There's, there's all kinds of tube feedings. You're gonna, the benefit is it's cost effective. It's super, it's, I'm going to say it's super cheap. In relation to IV feedings, it's a very cheap option, okay? Uh, preserves your integrity. It helps maintain your normal glucose levels because what's your brain need? Glucose, glucose and, and oxygen. oxygen. So if I have maintained glucose levels, I have better go function. Mm -mm. You're going to see a bunch of different kinds of tubes in the hospitals. You're going to see temporary tubes that either go through the client's nose or through their mouth. You're going to see long-term tubes that you probably saw those in the nursing home mm -hmm. where they have tube feedings. Um, so those are just the names of different. So you, when they talk about it and say they have a gastrostomy tube, you're going to know, oh, the gastrostomy tube, goes right that's this stomach. one. It goes yeah. into the stomach. Oh, a jejunostomy tube, goes that in one the goes jejunum. into the small intestine. It's where it enters the body is what the name is from. So if I'm giving a patient with a jejunostomy tube feeding, their feeding is a little bit different than everybody else. It has to be partially digested. That's why it smells so terrible because it has digestive enzymes in it and it has bypassed the stomach. stomach. Mm -hmm. So it's partially digested, that's why it smells terrible. Um, okay, our feeding methods. Intermittent means that every four hours, I'm gonna go in there and I'm gonna do your tube feeding. So I'm gonna hook up my little 60 cc syringe and I'm gonna pour it in there and I'm gonna stand there and wait till it goes in. I'm gonna flush you with some water and we're good for four hours, okay? Wow. Continuous means I put it on a pump and it's running at 65 cc's an hour or 75 cc's an hour. So that's the difference between those two. Who's monitoring it either way? The, the nurse. nurse. The nurse is. But one, I'm just physically doing it. That is more like eventually you're going to start eating again and I want you to mm -hmm. kind of get used to eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So I'm going to feed you breakfast, mm -hmm. lunch, and dinner. Long term. <laughs> You're probably never going to eat again like that, Ten so we're just going to do this because it's super convenient to put the tube feeding in there and turn the pump on, okay? But know what the difference is between those two. Here's the chapter this is in, and it's not in our cognition chapter, but it is on our syllabus. So these are the two charts I want you to look at, and this is the best practice for doing tube feeding with your clients, okay? And they're in chapter 60, which is a GI chapter. But I talked to GI and they said they don't want really to talk about it in here. So if I'm doing an NG tube and feeding my patient, I cannot start my tube feeding until I have an x-ray saying that it is in the right place. Because if it is in their lungs and I start their tube feeding at 75 cc an hour, what's going to happen to my patient? You're going to yeah, overflow. Yeah, I just cause aspiration because mm -hmm. I'm stupid. So <laughs> if you do no, not really? start any type of feeding, without a confirmation by a chest x-ray, okay? Not, you're gonna hear nurses say, well, I'm here, I'm with a body hurt Because you'll see them do that. They hold their stethoscope here, they push 60 cc's into the NG tube and you're bloop. Well, okay, you did that. But if you don't have an x-ray, you do not start that tube feeding. Um, for a J-tube or a, a gastrostomy tube or a jejunostomy tube, you're going to assess the tube itself has a little disc on it. So you want to pull that out just a little bit and assess the skin under the disc. Because what happens if that disc is smacked up against that skin for days on end and nobody looks? You're going to get skin breakdown underneath the little disc. So you're going to check underneath there and make sure that it's 
dry, it's clean, and you don't have skin breakdown. Uh, and then you're going to take a little split 4x4 four four gauze and put it underneath there mm -hmm. to protect the skin from the little plastic bits. Check and record residual. So I started my tube feeding. I need to see if they're absorbing it. I go in there and I pull out what's in their stomach to see what's in there. What do I do with that? I put it back yeah. in. Why do I do that? Right, I don't want to take all their acid. I really don't want to take all their electrolytes though. Because mm -hmm. what happens when somebody has suction or vomiting continuously? Mm -hmm. oh, mm -hmm. So I want to make sure that I'm giving them back all of their electrolytes and all of their acid, base balance stuff, so that I'm not messing them up. Now, what I really want to know is if it's more than what I've given them in tube feeding, and they're not digesting it. Do I need to do something with that information? Yes. What? Yes. I just checked the residual, and in four hours, they had 120. That's a lot if I'm only running it at 30 cc's an hour. Mm -hmm. That means everything's just still sitting there in their mm -hmm. stomach. So they need to know that. If you're using a continuous feeding, I'm going to change that tube feeding bag every 24. Your book says 24 to 48 hours. Most hospitals, their policy is every 24 hours. Mm -hmm. But your book does say 40, up to 48 hours. Why do I care about that? Bacteria. Yeah, bacteria is growing in that bag of tube feeding up there. So, so if it's on the test, you want us to enter every 48 hours? Well, I won't put that on the test like Just that. Just check in. <laughs> I wouldn't put it like that. You'll know. Me. So I'm going to change it every 24 to 48 hours just because of bacteria. Let me ask you this. My guy has two feeding to run at 75 an hour. That bag's going to hang for 24 hours. How much am I going to put in the bag when I hang the bag? They're going to get 75 cc's an hour. Mm -hmm. This is not a math problem. This is a common sense problem. I don't remember it. You got, it's a common sense problem. I'm going to put about four hours worth of feeding in there for a couple reasons. One, what if my pump malfunctions and I filled it up with 24 hours worth of tube feeding and I go back in there in a couple hours and my bag is empty? Is that good? No. no. Nope. Is that doctor going to be happy when you call and say, I'm sorry, they got 200 or 2,000 cc's of tube feeding in the last two hours? <laughs> no, he's not going to be happy. So I'm going to put in there just the amount, about four hours, so that I can go back and check because I want to make sure. The pump's going to yell when it's empty. You know what I'm saying? Okay. So he's not going to go without food. It's going to start beeping and it's going to say something's wrong and you're going to have to go add more feeding to it. That being said, um, I'm going to go to this slide. That being said, I want you to, where did you go? I thought there was a slide up here. Okay, I thought there was a slide up here that said it. Uh, I want you to, your tube feeding, if I open a can of tube feeding, what am I going to do with it? Date it. I'm going to date it. Mark it. I'm going to time it. Patient information. I'm going to put my patient information on it. Where am I going to put it? Um, in the fridge. In the fridge. Yeah. To cut down on bacterial growth. Okay? That's on the chart in the book. I'm sorry. I thought I put it on the slide. If I'm using the pump, I need to make sure it's set at the right rate. Let me tell you why. Because my friend who was supposed to give 60 cc's an hour, she cut it. She's, I just gave him guarantee of all of her tube at one time. I said, what do you mean? She goes, um, she got 600 cc's in like an hour. I said, why? Because the pump was set wrong. She didn't think to look at the pump and make sure it was set at 60, and somebody had set it at 600. So oh, always make sure your pump is what it's supposed to be set at. Um, elevate that head of the bed. Because if I'm laying flat and I'm feeding you two feet, I have to come, right come right back up. So I need to elevate the head of the bed. You're going to monitor their eyes and nose and their labs. <laughs> Because if I'm giving them tube feeding, I want to make sure that I'm giving them the nutrition they need. Flush that tube in between if you're doing intermittent feeding. Because if I just fed her, if I fed Haley her food, and I'm busy, I don't flush it with water, and I come back in there to give her a next feeding, guess what's all congealed and nasty in the tube? The tube feeding that I didn't flush through. So I want to flush it through with water. Uh, when you crush their medicines, yeah, don't add medicines to the bag of feeding that's hanging because what if mm. they don't get it all because they have something come up and you have to stop it. So you want to give the medicines in just your small cup of water, push the medicines with water, and then rebook the tube feeding back up. Don't mix your medicines in the big bag of feeding. 
Um, crush them as good as you can. Cipro and flagell do not mix. Do not crush them together. They have to be separate. That's not in there, but I'm just telling you that you're not. Don't crush sustained release medications because you're giving them the whole dose at one time. So you can't crush them. You've got to find an alternate way to give them, which is usually something liquid. So if you're studying, think about these things. What's wrong with my patient? What's the big things I need to know about that? What do I need to do to prevent the problem from happening in the first place? So that's with our injuries we talked about yesterday. Now that the problem's already occurred, what are my priority safety things for this person? Okay? And is there anything I can do to stop some complications that this person could have or stop an exacerbation of the disease like multiple sclerosis? Okay? So I'm going to open a drop box in Canvas. If you have any questions, put them in there. That way everybody can get the same answer because, you know, if you're thinking it, somebody else probably is too. Um, and I'm pretty good about answering pretty quick. And um, 